We just don't have the money to give this year. I've heard from so many people that they will give when they're in a better place or as soon as they get past a certain point. Have you seen our bills? It's not what you do, it's who you are. I just don't know. A life-giving church goes above and beyond. Is this going to be people? Because people matter to God. The first tenth is going to go to sponsoring a village in Guatemala to the glory of Jesus. We want a great big church to the glory of Jesus in Winsan. Right now we have about 100, 120 people showing up. We want to have 1,000 people showing up every weekend to start making an impact in that city. We need something above us, which is a roof. Our serve team voluntarily parks over there in the uncomfortable spots. Cars go down the street, they double park, they park each other in, it's a mess. We live in the least Christian area of the nation where the gospel needs the most impact. And so let's put our money where our faith is. So we want to say welcome to everybody watching online, wherever you're watching from. So glad to have you as well. And those watching through our television station up here in New England. So glad everybody's here with us together. But everybody who's in the house, could you just let them know how much better it is to actually come and be here? Come on. Yeah. Yeah, that's much better. We'd love to see you. My name is Tim. I'm the pastor here at Waters Church in North Attleboro. So glad that you're all with us today. And would you do this for me? If you're in-house, you can take your bulletins out because in the bulletins, two things are there. Uh, first is the, bullet, uh, the notes that we encourage you to take as we go through the message. Also, there is the giving commitment card. So if you didn't get this last week, you have a chance to get it this week. And uh, this is for a one-year commitment to Above and Beyond. A lot of money has already been pledged, and a lot of money has already come in. People, uh, just on a, a periphery glance of the, um, of the offerings so far, I, we have been moved and uh, just an, uh, inspired by the amazing amount of giving that has already transpired here this weekend. This is the last service of the weekend, so uh, it's your job to bring it home. And how many of you believe you can do that? Thank you so much. 17 of you believe we can do that, so we just need about $100,000 from each of you. We're all done. All right. I don't have a handheld mic today, you'll notice, because I'm not letting you leave the building without giving, okay? That's two hands to grab you with right there on the shoulders, okay? I'm not going to Joe Biden you. I'm not going to Joe Biden you. Just nice and gentle touch on the shoulders, okay? <laughs> all right. All uh, right. Above and Beyond, Part 5, The Business of God, Luke chapter 19, The Business of God. And uh, we've been prepping for this offering. Uh, I was amazed by last night's attendance. Um, it was perfect church skipping weather last night. First, like, 65-degree day since, I think, October. And now, uh, yet we had an amazing offering coming in last night. Just a testament to the fact that the people of this church are for real, they're givers, they're generous, God's moving in their hearts. Amen. Luke chapter 19, I want to look at a guy that we, this is what we do with this story that I'm about to read. We separate his story from what Jesus teaches right after his story. Now the guy's name, familiar Bible name, is Zacchaeus. And usually we read the story of Zacchaeus and we stop at the end when Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. And then we stop. And we're like, okay, cool story about Zacchaeus. But Jesus doesn't stop. In Zacchaeus' house, Jesus tells a parable that ties to Zacchaeus' story. So with that in mind, can we stand together? Just wanted to give you the, the framework for today's uh, scripture reading. And we're going to read that in-between passage between Zacchaeus' moment with Jesus and the parable that comes after the moment Zacchaeus has with Jesus. Verse 8, picking up the story, Jesus is in Zacchaeus' house, and it says this, And Zacchaeus uh, stood and said to the Lord, Behold, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. 
Now keep reading, because usually we stop right there. Keep reading. As they heard these things. So this story that you're about to hear ties to what just happened with Zacchaeus. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell them a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went out into a far country to receive a kingdom and then return, calling 10 of his servants. He gave them 10 minas, one mina each, and said to them, engage in business until I come. Engage in business until I come. This is the last passage portion we're going to read together standing up, so I want you to say it with me. Engage in business, business until I come. The business of God. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that we will hear your voice. I pray that My words will be what you want them to be. We will hear nothing that you don't want us to hear. And mostly, we pray that we will see Jesus and him only. In his mighty name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a seat. Have a seat. I have a question for you. Are you a doer or a donter? Oh, thank you. It was a rhetorical question, but thank you for the response. Uh, how do you measure your life with Jesus? Are you a doer or a donter? Meaning, there's a lot of people that measure their life with Christ on the rules. Yes? The don'ts. Don't do this. God will get you. Don't do that. Christians aren't supposed to. And I think about this. Most of my life growing up, I was a donter. And I found out the hard way that when you're a donter, you become a downer. And have you ever met a donter who pulls you down? One of those Christians is all about what you shouldn't do as a Christian. Everything's wrong. Everything's bad. If it's fun, it must be sin. Stop it. Yeah? I was raised Pentecostal. Pentecostal, they came up with rules because there wasn't enough rules in the Bible. So they ended up adding some. Everything was a sin. Music was a sin. Movies were a sin. Dancing was a sin. Girls wearing pants was a sin. Could you imagine if we were in that generation? I mean, this is why the church wondered why it didn't have a cultural impact for 100 years in this country. I was raised Pentecost. Everything was a sin. I remember my first, my first youth pastor. He was saying, oh, I just want to lead you in Jesus. And then my mother took him to our house, through our house on a tour. And he came to my bedroom. And he saw on the floor of my bedroom next to my bed was a cassette tape by the great band Poison. <laughs> How many love you some Poison back in the days? Long-haired, girly-looking guys singing about talk dirty to me. Come on, somebody. <laughs> And he said, oh, I saw some disturbing material on your floor, Tim. That's not something that a Christian would do. Donters, they're downers. Everything's bad. Everything's wrong. Measure our lives by the rules that we follow. And uh, my mother actually had it worse than me. She grew up in the previous Pentecostal generation. This is the generation that believed uh, cards, playing cards were a sin. Dice was a sin. Jumping jacks were a sin, for heaven's sakes. My mother and her sisters saved three months of allowance to go out and buy themselves a record player and a record. And the record that they bought was not some Jay-Z explicit lyrics album. It was You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog (laughs) by the late, great Elvis Presley, who may or may not still be alive. (laughs) And my Pentecostal grandfather heard them playing, playing, you ain't nothing but a hound dog, came up the stairs to their bedroom, walked in, took the record player, and smashed it over his knee and destroyed three months of their three allowances in a hot second, saying, that's the devil's music. And my mother said, don't be cruel. (laughs) No, she didn't say that. But I thank God she did not raise me, and my father did not raise me in one of those households. Our church was very legalistic that I grew up in, very rules-oriented. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. And, and you know what? You can't measure your life as a Christian by the don'ts. It's depressing. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of don'ts in the Bible. 
In fact, there's 10 big ones. There's 10 big don'ts, and every other don't flows from those 10 big don'ts, right? So I'm not saying break the don'ts, but I will say this. I've read the Bible many times, and it takes a long time before you get to a don't. You read the Bible for yourself, and you see, where's the first don't? Like the first one is actually in the very first couple of chapters when he says, don't eat that one tree. But that's like one tree out of all the trees. Like, I give you everything. The whole place is yours. The earth is yours. Have at it. But there's just one don't. And because they broke that one don't, then we got a bunch of other don'ts because our hearts fell. Our hearts were changed because of sin. That's our problem, our sinful condition. Not what we do, but what we are. And Jesus came to save us from that condition. And I believe that he came to save us from that condition to turn us from people who are obsessed with what the don'ts should be to what the do's should be. What are you doing? Today I want to give you a chance, today you have a chance to be a doer. So another question, what would you consider a good Christian? Like what would you consider a good Christian? Some of you, it's all about the don'ts. It's all about the don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't go with girls who do. Right? Don't do that. And then and, and you just start to think, okay, well, how far can I go before I shouldn't don't? How far can I do before I don't? And all these things, these stupid little laws that we try to come up with to make sure that we're living just as much bad as we can because we're obsessed with the don'ts. Instead of worrying about your don'ts, what about if you started thinking about your do's? I think that sometimes we can't get over the things we shouldn't do because that's all we think about. Like, I have kids, and the best way to get them to think about what they shouldn't do is to tell them not to do it. Don't touch that. What? Why not? Stop. <laughs> and I think that that's the human nature. Like, the moment we see something isn't right or shouldn't, we shouldn't do something is the moment we are more attracted to it than ever. But I thought about this. What if we got more concerned with what we should do so that we didn't have time to worry about what we shouldn't do? Write this down in your notes. What if God was more interested in what you did than what you didn't do? What if God was more interested in what you did than what you didn't do? Like, you're not going to get to heaven and brag about what you didn't do. <laughs> and there's no verse. Listen, there's no verse in the Bible that says God is going to reward you for what you avoid. There's no verse. But you look at a lot of Christians, you would think that the reward system in heaven is based on how much fun you robbed yourself of on earth. How many things you gave up on earth. And therefore you will. No, here's, here's, here's the reward system in heaven. You are rewarded according to your deeds. Somebody say deeds. You got some deeds that are, that are following your creeds. We're not about just creeds, we're about deeds. In other words, what do you believe? Creed, but what do you do? Because that's what you believe. And you're gonna be judged. I'm gonna be judged not on what I didn't do, but what I did do. Two kinds of sins, two kinds of sins. The first is the sins of commission. That is committing an offense that God doesn't want you to do. But there's another kind of sin. It's called the sin of omission. Not doing the things that God wanted you to do. And when we get to heaven, I don't want you to be ready. I want you to be ready to receive the the, the reward that God has for you because you believe that God was a rewarder of those who did the things that he wanted them to do. Now, we don't get to heaven based on what we do. We get to heaven based on what we believe. Somebody say believe. So you don't get to heaven because you did a bunch of things for Jesus. You get to heaven because Jesus did one thing for you. He died on a cross. He went to the grave. He came out of the grave for you. You get to heaven when you believe that. That's it. Case closed. You're on your way. But if you believe that, it should mean something in what you do with your life. And when I read the Bible, I see a God who is more interested in giving us things to do than things to don't. Like first page of the Bible, Genesis 128. God blesses them and says to Adam and his wife, he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. The word dominion means rule over creation. In other words, God said in the beginning of creation, look, this is the earth. Have it. Own it. Make it work for you. That means that every cultural endeavor that brings life and flourishing to other people is the business of God. 
It is not just the business of God to be here up in this church preaching to you. This is not just the business of God. Everything that you do that doesn't bring harm to others, that doesn't kill, that doesn't slay, that doesn't swindle and rob and enslave. No, the things that you do that bring health, healing, life, services, goods to better people's lives, that is the business of God from the first page of the Bible. And I believe God likes doers. And I think about this, when Jesus came and, came and called his disciples, when Jesus came and picked his 12, ask yourself this question, what kind of guys did he pick? Did anybody remember? Anybody go to Sunday school? Yeah. What, what, what kind of guys? What did they do? Fishermen. He went and found, he didn't go to the, to the temple to find religious professionals. He went to the shores of the Sea of Galilee to find himself some fishermen, some tax collectors at their tax collecting booth. Paul, the apostle, greatest apostle ever, guess what he did for a living? He made tents. Jesus, think about this. If Jesus came in 21st century America to Massachusetts to find people to start his movement today, he wouldn't go to Harvard. You know where he'd go? He would go to Gloucester. New Bedford, give me some guys who know how to handle the storms of life, right? That's what he would do. He would find guys who knew how to work. And this is the thing about the Bible that you may not even have understood or may have never even heard this before. But I thought about it and it's true. Not one book in the New Testament was written by a religious professional. Not one book. The book of Matthew written by a tax collector. The book of Luke, written by a doctor. All the apostle Paul's writings, written by a tent maker. First and second Peter, written by a fisherman. James, John, these are the guys who wrote your New Testament. Not a single one of them was a pastor or a religious professional or a priest or a nun or one of these people that we think, oh, that's the business of God and outside of the building is the business of the world. It's all God's business. And when we, when we hear about Jesus, we're hearing about Jesus through people who knew how to work with their hands and did things with their hands, and Jesus used them where they were and beyond where they were to bring the gospel to people such as us. So when it comes to Christian faith, here's what I'm asking you to do. Don't let the don'ts overshadow the do's. What are you doing for the gospel? What are you doing as a follower of Jesus? Not just what are you avoiding. I don't want your life to just be down because of the don'ts. I want your life to flourish because of the do's. I say all this because we're going to talk about a doer. His name is Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus is remembered for one specific attribute. Now, on the count of three, what is that attribute? One, two, three. Short, yes. Thank you for the one person who answered that question. Okay. He was short, but he, before he was short... We have other things that actually tell us what he was like. Look what it says in verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, somebody say behold. There was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector. That's the first thing we find out. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was the head of the tax collectors. Now you say, well, isn't that sinful? No. No, they thought it was sinful because he was collecting taxes, taxes for the Roman system, but the Roman system also provided the Jews with protection and roads and infrastructure, and so the, you know, the Jewish people had to pay taxes, and there is, and I've read the Bible many times, and there is no passage that outlaws collecting taxes. I wish there was, <laughs> but there's none, right? He was a chief, and he was, last word, what? He was rich. rich. And you would think, okay, wait a second. I've read the book of Luke. I've read a lot of the book of Luke, and here's what, I he here's what I see. Every time Jesus meets a rich person, there's a problem. He doesn't like rich people. Mm -mm. No, no, no. Just a couple chapters earlier, he told the rich young ruler to give up all his riches, give it to the poor, and follow Jesus. And if he did that, he'd find treasure in heaven. And we Christians in modern America today think that that one instance was a blanket statement, a universal command for the whole body of Christ so that if you're a Christian and if you got money, enjoy it while you can because you're going straight to hell. 
Like we think this, this actually kind of subconsciously gets into our mindset. So rich people can't go to heaven, poor people do. But that, don't you understand, is a works-based religious system. And no one gets to heaven based on what they are or what they do. They get to heaven based on what Jesus did and who he is. It is not the gospel. Listen very carefully, because I know we are in the cold, hard Catholic Northeast. And we think that poverty is a virtue. And the really poor people are like getting the front row seats in heaven. Where did you read that? Abraham was a rich man. David was a rich man. Solomon was a rich man. Noah was a rich man. Noah had to build a boat. Anybody with a boat that can hold all the animals is instantly, in my opinion, rich. Anybody else with me on that? Like you got an eight-person boat, you think you're rich. <laughs> Talk to Noah. He had a boat so big, the whole animal kingdom could come for a ride for a whole year. That makes him rich, friend. That makes him rich. And God used rich Noah to save the world. God used rich Abraham to bring about the family of God. God used rich Nicodemus to bury Jesus. Rich Joseph of Marathea to have a grave to bury Jesus that Jesus would one day leave empty. Rich people change the world in Jesus' name. Riches are not the problem. It's our hearts that are the problem. So if our hearts are tied to riches, we will fall for the idea that we can't have riches if we want to have Jesus. But that's just not true. So this guy named Zacchaeus is rich and successful and a member of nobility. And the Bible says in verse 3, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but he couldn't because he was short. And so we sing that stupid little song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. But before he was a wee little man, he was a rich little man and an important little man. And he wanted to see Jesus, but he couldn't. So he ran ahead and he climbed a tree to see what he could see. You guys are not Sunday school people, so you can't sing along with me. I get it. That's what we used to sing back in the legalistic days, okay? And he saw Jesus walking by, and Jesus sees him. We know the story? Come down, Zacchaeus. I'm going to have dinner at your house today. Zacchaeus is like, whoa. Now listen, Zacchaeus ran and climbed a tree. He was a rich, important business leader in his community. And he ran and he climbed a tree. <laughs> now you think about that in our generation. A rich, successful business leader in our generation. Three-piece suit, right? Think about this. He's walking around. Oh, Jesus is here. Imagine, he's running. And he's climbing a tree in a three-piece suit. Now we would call that weird to see a guy in a three-piece suit up in a tree. But in Jesus' day, they didn't wear three-piece suits. Listen, they wore robes. <laughs> you ever see somebody run in a robe? What's the first thing you think? Please stop running. You're wearing a robe. <laughs> I don't want to see that. He didn't just run. He climbed a tree in a robe. You gotta look up and say, hey, Zacchaeus, feeling a draft. Like, let's, let's think about this. But what I want you to see is that Zacchaeus did not let what people might say about him stop him from seeing who Jesus was. And so many people, they let what other people think dictate how far they're going to take their faith in Christ. They let, they let, oh, my parents don't like it, so maybe I should temper it down. Oh, my, 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 my spouse doesn't like it, so maybe I shouldn't be so serious. Oh, my kids, they're not comfortable. Oh, this, that, the other thing. Or my friends, my friends don't think it's cool to follow Jesus. Listen, who gives a stinking rip about their opinion when you know that the God of heaven loves you and approves of you? You got to get that into your spirit. Are you going to let other people shape the faith that you have, or are you going to put your faith in the one who made you? Right? Like, let's think about that. And this is what I love about Zacchaeus. He was a doer. He was so much of a doer, he ran and climbed a tree in a robe to see Jesus. And when Jesus sees that, he says, I want to have dinner with that kind of guy. And he goes. And the, and the people, the religious people, they all grumble. Verse 7, they grumbled. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Where does it say that he was a sinner? See, they made up rules that weren't in the Bible. Just like we do today. Are, are you tracking with what I'm saying? And then he's having dinner at Zacchaeus' house. Very next verse, Zacchaeus says, Lord, here and now, behold, the half of my goods I give. Somebody say give. Notice that he doesn't say I will give. He doesn't say I will give, does he? 
Look at the words. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give. And in the Greek translation of the New Testament, the original translation of the New Testament, the Greek word is in the present perfect, which means that Zacchaeus was already giving half of his goods to the poor. It doesn't mean that he started when Jesus came to his house. This man already had faith in Christ. He already had faith enough to run up the tree. That means that he was already walking after Christ. But now he meets him face to face. And he says, Lord, this is my practice. I give half of what I get to the poor. And then he says, and if I defraud anybody, I restore it fourfold. Now, what do you call a person who can afford to give half of their stuff to the poor and repay anybody that they defraud four times much what they defrauded them? How, what do you call that kind of person? Super rich. Like super rich. And Jesus doesn't say, wait a second, weren't you with me a couple of chapters ago when I told that rich guy to give all his money away? Weren't you there? No, no, no. Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house, for this man is also a child of Abraham. Proof being that you cannot lift one portion of the scriptures out of context to make it say what it never said. Zacchaeus, you are in. Salvation. Who is salvation? Jesus. The word, the name Jesus is from the Hebrew Yeshua. Yeshua means the Lord saves. Yeshua entered Zacchaeus' house. Salvation came. He came in the name of Jesus. And through Jesus and Jesus alone, Zacchaeus today is in heaven. Today salvation came to this house, came, comes to this house. He's a, and, and so here's what, here's what Luke is brilliantly telling us through the gospel. He's saying the people that you don't think are in because of your man-made rules, like the rich people and successful people, they actually might be in. And the people that you think are out because of your man-made rules and your don'ts and your little lists and your little legalists, they might actually be out. What I'm trying to tell you is I think God is more concerned with what you do than what you don't do. No one is getting to heaven because of what they avoided. No one. Everybody is getting to heaven by what they embraced. Did you embrace Christ? Did you receive him? That's an action. That's doing something. And so in the context of Zacchaeus, verse 11, the key verse as they heard these things. As they heard what things? As they heard Zacchaeus was in. Jesus came for people like Zacchaeus. Then Jesus says, let me tell you a story to illustrate what I'm talking about. And he says, there was a nobleman, and he went away to receive a kingdom and come back, and he called 10 of his servants, and he said, here's, here's what you, here's, here, here we go, guys. Here, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you one mina each. A mina is worth three months' salary. One mina each. Occupy. Work with this amount, with this amount of money until I come. Engage in, say the word, business. business. Everybody say the word, right? Engage in business. Business until I go, Jesus is concerned with your business. So point number one, my business is God's business. And I don't care what your business is. It's God's business. And God is interested in getting up in your business. He wants your business to glorify him because he's the one that gave you the business. You say, I'm not a business owner. Are you a participant in somebody's business? Or the government's business? The school system's business? The post office business? God's concerned about that. And we need people in business living out the Christian faith. We need godly contractors, godly politicians, godly school teachers, godly lawyers, godly doctors, godly nurses, godly, godly janitors. Right? Some of you are guilty of doing this. You think that God's business happens here up on this stage. And one hour a week we come and we watch God's business and then we build a wall between this business and what we do for a job. And we think, okay, now these things, never the twain shall meet. Wrong. It's all God's. You say, but I work very hard for my business. I work very hard. I went to the right schools and I did the right thing and I did it. <laughs> okay, yeah, but somebody gave you oxygen. You didn't make your own oxygen, did you? you? You didn't make your own heartbeat, your own blood work, right? That came from God. My business is God's business. Engage in business, his business, until he comes again. And he's looking for a return. I love what the NIV says. Put this money to work until I come back. Oh, the church is not. Christian, being a Christian is not about what you do with your money. That's, that's, that's unholy. That's unsanctified. Money is evil. Don't you know the Bible says the money is the root of all evil? It doesn't say that. The Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil. Some of you are like, what? 
I'm, I'm sure I heard that somewhere. Yeah, you heard it from somebody who twisted the scriptures to say what they wanted it to say. The Bible says the love of money, the love of money is a root of many kinds of evil. Read it for yourself and find out that what I'm saying is true. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. The love of money. So money itself is not immoral. Money is amoral. Listen to this. Money can build a hospital or it could build a casino. Right? That's really true. Money could build a school or, in modern America, a pot factory. Which one's going to benefit society? Which one's going to do more good? See, we, we live in a country that thinks if we put more money into pot, we will be better off. Wrong. Meanwhile, we struggle with education systems. We struggle with family systems. We struggle with all these other things. And what are we doing? We can't handle our problems, so we just puff the magic dragon into oblivion. Hallelujah. <laughs> money is amoral. It's what we do with it. Your money, your business. Oh, I'm just a waiter. Wait tables to the glory of Jesus. Oh, I, I, I'm just, you know, I, I just, I just, I'm just a second grade school teacher. Well, you teach those kids as if you really believe that every single one of them is made in the image of God. And you tell them how valuable they are. Oh, I can't talk about Jesus. I didn't say talk about Jesus. I said you tell them how valuable they are. You live out your Christian life within the confines and the rules of your society or your situation to the glory of the name of Jesus. Because the business of God does not just exist on this stage, ladies and gentlemen. It is everywhere on every continent and in every country. And we need, as his people, to understand that so that we can get busy doing what God wants us to do. Amen. Number two, God wants his business to increase. Did you see this? This is what happens in the parable. We actually find out in the parable that the nobleman actually is expecting increase from the investment he makes into his servants. Listen to what it says in verse 15. When he returned, he called his servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had. What's the next word? Gained by doing business. He wants gain. He wants increase. Oh, I don't, I don't want to get too rich, you know, because if I get too rich, then money will go to my head and I'll become, I'll put my trust in money and not in God. What are you talking about? You know what I hope for every single one of you in this building that loves Jesus? You know what I hope? I hope you become filthy, stinking rich. Yeah, I do. I really do. I hope your business takes off if you love Jesus. If you don't love Jesus, I hope you're broke. (laughs) Because I want people who love Jesus and knows what to do with money to bless people to have the money. The number one problem with our country right now is that the people that don't love Jesus have all the money. And the sanctimonious Christians who believe that if we don't do certain things, we are more holy, have, conf- have abdicated their opportunities for more money because they have falsely believed that money is the root of all evil. Am I talking to anybody yet? See, I am okay with you getting prosperous and successful, and so is God. He wants a gain from what he has invested in your life. The first servant comes by. Verse 16, he says, Lord, your mina, your three months' wages have earned me 10 minas more. Now, quick, quickly, any mathematicians, what kind of return is that? That's a 1,000% return. Now, does the master say, mmm, shame on you. That's too much money for you to have. No, he says, well done. <laughs> you increased, you you 10 times my money, I don't even know what that is. That's triple, quadruple. I don't even know past quadruple. What did you say there? 10 times my money. Good job. God wants an increase from the things that he has poured into your life. And when I read the Bible, I realize that that's all over the scriptures. God looking for his people to increase. Look at this. I talked about Noah with his big stinking boat. After the boat experience, after the flood, God says to Noah, listen, for, uh, Genesis 9, 7, and you, Noah, be fruitful, multiply. Next word, everybody. Increase greatly on the earth. Multiply in it. I want you to increase. I want to see increase in your life, God says to Noah. How about Deuteronomy? When God calls his people out of slavery from Egypt, in, in Egypt into the promised land, and, and God, gives him, God gives them commandments through, uh, through Moses. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. Look what it says. If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God. In other words, if you love me and you're careful to do what I say, I will set you high above all the nations. I will elevate you. 
Skip down to verse 11 in the same chapter. And the Lord will make you, say the next three words, everybody. Not just prosperous, not just abounding, but abounding in prosperity. This is God's word. The fruit of your womb, the fruit of your livestock, the fruit of your ground, it's all going to abound in prosperity. And my favorite, Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is on the law of the Lord his God. And on that law, he does meditate both day and night. Verse 3, he is like a tree planted by streams of living water, which yields its fruit in season and his leaf does not wither. And in all that he does, he, say the last word, prospers. Are you catching the theme? Increase, prosperity, abounding. These are the value system of God. And yet some of you think that if you get too far and too ahead in life, somehow, some way, you're breaking some unwritten rule. What are you talking about? I want Jesus-loving people to have all the money so that we can change the world in Jesus' name. Absolutely. And I will not apologize for that. Yes, there are some people that start out with God and then start loving money. Yes, we pray for them. Don't you be one of them. That's why you come to church and let me tell you about this, so that you can learn how to not put your trust in the increase God gives you, but you can see the increase that God gives you for what it is, the blessing of God that you can now use to do the business of God. Number three, God rewards good business. God rewards good business. This is what this parable teaches us. This is why Zacchaeus matters. The wee little man who put all his money, half of his money into the poor. And Jesus said today, this man, this man's in. This man is a follower. And uh, in the parable, it says that the guy, the, 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 um, the nobleman says to the servant, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. <laughs> the initial investment in this, in, this, in this servant was three months' wages, and he does well, and he turns it into thir- uh, 30 months' wages. And the master says, because of your faithfulness here, because of your increase, because of your, your, your trustworthiness, I'm going to put you in charge of 10 cities. That is a big, stinking reward, 10 cities. Now, we have scores of evidence in modern America of business leaders who have done their business in the name of Jesus and with godly values, and they have prospered. One of them, most of you all love, the founder of Christian Chicken, <laughs> Truett Cathy, Chick-fil-A, right? Closed every Sunday. Why? Because they want to honor God with their business. And he has honored God with his business. He's dead now. He's in heaven rejoicing his eternal reward. But he prospered while he was on earth. Listen to what he says. I, it, this is Direct quote from Truett Cathy, founder of Chick-fil-A. It seems to me that the more I give, the more I have. What a paradox to the message of the world. No, it's the more more you have, the more you can give. No, the more you give, the more you have. He says, I have a moral and corporate compass to glorify God by being a faithful steward. That means to give back a portion of God's blessings to others to help people we come in contact with. Or David Green, the founder of Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby was in the news a couple of years ago in 2014 because they had to take uh, the presidential administration to court over the contraception mandate in the healthcare system. And they won that court case, which actually becomes a precedent for religious freedom for generations. For generations. And um, David Green, founder of Hobby Lobby, they give 50% of their pre tax increase their pre-tax um, income to churches that preach the gospel. 50%, not 10%, 50%. Because he believes God has pro- blessed me abundantly. I need to put back into the kingdom of God what God has given me. A modern day Zacchaeus. Do you know that when they went to court uh, with the presidential administration in 2014, the opposing lawyer who fought them, okay, that guy who fought against religious freedom, Uh, ended up coming to the grand opening of the Museum of the Bible a few years later. Why do I mention that? Because the Museum of the Bible was subsidized, was funded by David Green and his family, Hobby Lobby. It's in Washington, D.C. I was there last year. It is gorgeous. It is beautiful, modern, amazing. Walked through it. It was unbelievable. You got to go. 
And when they were doing the ribbon cutting, the grand opening for the Museum of the Bible, do you know that they had to go to the city for the rights to take over a historic building? And the person, the lawyer that helped them secure the rights and showed up at the ribbon company cut, cutting ceremony was the very lawyer that opposed them in their Supreme Court case. And on that day, they said, this is the best, most beautiful museum in the city right now. We wish you the best of luck. That's called God using your faithfulness to make your enemies your friends. When you honor God, the Bible says this, if a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. You honor God with what he gives you, God will open up doors that were formerly closed to you. David Green, D John Tyson, who took over Tyson Chicken Company from his father. He was an alcoholic, running the company to the ground. In the year 2000, he came to Christ. And then he decided to make the whole company more Christian-centered, more gospel-centered, more, more biblical in their approach to business. No, he didn't make everybody go to church. Do you know what he did? He hired 100 counselors, 100 Christian counselors, to watch over the spiritual lives of his 100,000 employees in the year 2000. Cleaned up the company corporate structure, uh, got some things right with regulations and food processing services. And in three years, the company quadrupled in valuation. In three years. They have given over 100 meals to disaster reliefs and emergency services in the last 19 years. Tyson Chicken Company. That's the power of the gospel changing somebody who's doing business. And God rewards it. Number four, finally, God rejects thoughtless business. God rejects thoughtless business. If you take your life and you look at it and you say, it's not that much, it doesn't matter. I'm just this, I'm just that, I'm just a school teacher, I'm just this, I'm just a janitor, I'm just a waitress, I'm just this, whatever. It's thoughtless business. This is what happens. Look at this parable. Look at how it unfolds. Another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I have kept away, laid in a handkerchief. By the way, who would ever store three months' salaries in a handkerchief? I'll tell you who. Somebody who disrespected the master. And some people are doing that right now. You are disrespecting what God has given you. You think it's so small. Well, yeah, it starts small, but if you do it right, if you do it God's way, it increases and it multiplies. If you do it the world's way, it will be lost. That's the point that I'm trying to make. That's what Jesus is trying to say. Look what he says. I was afraid of you. Fear. Oh, I don't know if I can give. I'm afraid. Don't let fear call the shots. I was afraid because you take. Oh, some people here, you think God's a taker. The devil has got you convinced. The devil has you giving God the credit for his work. The devil has you giving God the credit for the devil's work. Oh, he's a taker. He's just out to get me. And even if I increase, he's just going to take it away anyway. That's the, kind of, that's the God I serve. Where did you get this idea? That's not the God that we serve. The God we serve gave his son. The God we serve will give us all things with his son. You can't outgive the God we serve. Amen. So what I find... It's that people who live by the rules, they live by the rules. Like, imagine this ruler is your lifespan. And this is why some people don't give. They're afraid. They're so afraid. And you know what they're mostly afraid of? Many people in this church right now. You're afraid of this little black area right here. You know what this area is? Retirement. Retirement. You spend all this time, or at least maybe all this time right here. <laughs> like, you're growing up, then you go party, make some bad decisions, have kids, <laughs> Realize you got to get back to church. Start going to church. Okay, start making money. Okay, wait a second. Wait a second. What about this? What about this? What about this? And you start worrying all this. You're worrying about this. But listen, you might not get to this. Did you hear what I just said? You might not get to this. And if you do get to this, you might be too tired to enjoy it. <laughs> Let's be honest, right? You might, you might be sipping through a straw. Sipping your steak through a straw right here if you don't play the cards right, right now. You don't start getting serious about business. My, fa my grandfather, he was a carpenter, and he had one of these things. And so, you know what I'm trying to do in this series? The ruler right here, the little spot you're trying to worry about. You know what I'm trying to do in this series? I'm trying to give you some perspective. That's called perspective right here. That's not the end. You're going to die. And if you're in Christ, your life in Christ is just getting started. And I have a question for you. I have a question for all you people who aren't, who aren't givers. 
to the gospel, who haven't put their faith in Christ enough to put their money into the business of God. When you're in heaven, three billion years from now, right here, that's three billion years right there, okay? Do you think that you're going to give a rip about that little section? Uh Uh-uh. No way. How's this looking? Spend your life not on this, on this, and you will be rewarded. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the devil's work. Stop giving God the credit for the devil's work. God is not a taker. He's come to give you life and life abundantly. So the last thing I want you to write down in your notes is this. Last thing I want, good business invests what God gives into what God loves and never knows lack. I'm telling you something, God will reward you in the next life, but he'll also reward you in this life. He will. We've got people in this church you can talk to. I had a guy come to me between the services, between first and second service. He said, you talked about money so much in this series, I couldn't take it anymore. I started to give. <laughs> I'll take that testimony. As I was preaching... As I was preaching in one of the services, he got on his phone, logged on, and gave. As I was preaching. This is between the services he's telling me this. He went to work the next day. He got a call from a place that he applied to. He got a new job offer that's going to give him a 25% increase in his income. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. So I went to Guatemala a couple weeks ago, and I want to introduce you to a guy. I call him a modern-day Zacchaeus. A modern-day Zacchaeus. He was a rich jeweler from our backyard here in Rhode Island. God radically changed his life. And he gave his life to God, and now he's saving the lives of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in the country of Guatemala. And we're partnering with him, and 10% of everything that comes in for this campaign is going to that organization. I want you to watch this video. Welcome, Carlos. Thank you, thank you. Great to see you here. Last time I saw you was uh, just a few weeks ago in Zacapa, Guatemala, and the Hope of Life campus. It's kind of cool, almost surreal to see you here. Can you share with us, share with Waters Church people um, where you were at, your story? When I came to America 50 years ago, I was only 16, and the only thing I had in my mind was the American dream. I wasn't even looking for Jesus. I was looking to make myself better. What was your business? Jewelry business. Jewelry business. I used to come to this building. This I used building. to do business with wow. this, the company that used to own this building. For 20 years, I worked very hard. I became a successful businessman. Mm. But there was something in my inside that was empty. I wanted God to tell me what to do. It was either I couldn't hear his voice or I didn't want to hear his voice. I had the theology. I had the money to do big things. But I wasn't doing it. So 15 years in the business of jewelry, you were very successful. Successful. And then what happened? I ended up in a bed. I was having a hard time to walk. There were days where I couldn't even get out of my bed. I lost all my skin in my face, my chest, a lot of my fingernails, toenails. Wow. And then I couldn't walk. I couldn't even take a cup of coffee to my mouth. I felt like it was it for me. And one day I said, I want to go back to the country I was born. So uh, I go back to my country and I didn't even want my people to see me the way I look. look my body was destroyed. Mm. And one day I was in my town in a little house made out of pieces of wood, little cardboards. I went to to my town, to the village I left behind. Yeah. And I hide in a place where nobody could go see me. Okay. The successful man had lost it all. Now you're still sick at this point? Sick. Okay. And all I had was money. I was so poor when I went back that all I had was money. All you had was money. That's all good. All I had was money. But I didn't have a life. And somehow a little girl brought a blind man to my room to beg for money. I remember that they changed my life. After he left, I told the little girl, take some money out of my pocket, and they left. I started praying to God. I said, God, I want to walk again. I need you to heal me. I know if you heal me, 
I dedicate my life to the poor. It was like a business deal. And three days later, I sat in my bed for the first time. For many months, I couldn't even sit in my bed. Wow. Sat in my bed. I got up slowly, and I walk about a couple of hundred meters to buy one acre of land. You got up to buy land? Buy land, okay. one acre of land, to keep my promise, to put up one building for the homeless. That was my promise. I didn't promise nothing else. And then I found out that God wanted me to be a businessman yeah. in his kingdom. In his kingdom. kingdom, yeah. I purchased the one acre of land to put up a place for 60 homeless people. That's my first building. Today, we have over 200 buildings in the compound. And we dedicate over a thousand projects out of the compound every year. A thousand outside over a thousand of the compound. Schools, wow. houses, hospitals, clinics, water projects. That was just the beginning of a big thing that God had for me. So we're in a financial campaign right now. This is the last uh, week of it, and that's why it's, 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 it's not coincidence that you're here. You're our neighbor. You're from where exactly? Rhode Island. Yeah. I live in Johnston. And live in Johnston. Yeah. And, and, and me and, and Pastor Tim, we had to go to Guatemala to meet to our meet brother in Christ and our neighbor who just lives right around the corner in Johnston. That's great. You know? <laughs> and, and now we're not just brothers in Christ, but we want to be partners. We want Thank to you. partner with Hope of Life. Thank you. And 10% of whatever comes in through this Above and Beyond campaign is going to go to Hope of Life. And, and I know you're talking to, to Pastor Tim about what we can do for the kingdom in the name of Jesus and Waters Church over at Hope of Life. I like to use it saving lives transforming lives. Our organization saves over 4,000 babies from dying every year. Every year. We go up into the mountains and we bring the babies down to our hospital. An average would cost us about $1,000 to save one baby. 1000 to 1200 or somewhere around there. Let's say you send me $2,000. It's two babies. But imagine if you send me $50,000. Yeah. That's 50 yeah. babies. And I'll send you the pictures of the babies. Oh, that'd be great. The, this church rescue. One thing I like to tell you, congregation, and the friends that, that come every time, don't be afraid to invest in the kingdom. Sometimes we go to God to beg for something, to cry for something, but we haven't invested in that place. Mm. I haven't invested money in the kingdom. Maybe God wanted me to go the extra mile, and he wanted me complete 100%. Yeah. That's why he put me through that. I think so. If I have to talk to business people today, I will tell them, don't be afraid to invest in the kingdom, but be afraid to go through a grinder, a grinder that I went through it, to believe the investing in the kingdom and lend it to the Lord. Okay. If I have to speak to one of your members in the church, I said, don't be afraid to, to become a businessman by investing in the kingdom. That's good. Sometimes we're afraid. It's all I got. Why I got to give it? Come on. Trust. Do we trust God or what? So Carlos, it's been 30 years since you rescued the first baby uh, in Guatemala for the hope of life. Why do you still do it? Why do you still have this passion? Well, Where's it come from? Number one, I was the first baby saved. Right, you were the first and one. I, every minute of my life in earth, I want to dedicate it to save lives and transform. Every day, I want to do something that breaks the heart of Jesus. And what it breaks the heart of Jesus is when a child is crying, yeah. saying, I'm hungry. I need you. Help me. Today, we all gonna go home. We're gonna go home and we got a good meal. But somewhere in the mountains is a child saying, I'm hungry. I don't wanna die. Help me. So please, if you're listening to me, today you can do something by saving one life.